long experiment. I know it's been a while, but I've been busy with this. Now, the objective of this experiment was to find out how much food I can add to a 6-gallon or 22-liter tank while keeping it no water change. Now, why is this important? Why do I want to find out how much food I can add to a tank before it fails? Now, the reason this is important is because the fish food is the source of pollution for your tank. Now, your tank is just like this biological machine that is designed to process that fish food and neutralize it. Now, think about adding fish food to just an empty tank with nothing in it. The food is going to rot. The water is going to foul. Now, that doesn't happen in a properly built tank because you have creatures in there that can process that food. Your fish are not the source of pollution. They're just simply the first guys that go in. They break down the food into smaller components so the bacteria and other organisms in your tank can take care of the rest. Now, everyone talks about the nitrogen cycle, right? If you, The first thing you learn about a filtration in a tank is the nitrogen cycle, how ammonia becomes nitrite and becomes nitrate. And where do you think that ammonia comes from? Where do you think the nitrogen in the nitrogen cycle comes from? It comes from the protein that is inside the fish food. So you're adding nitrogen by adding the fish food, the protein, and your fish are just the first step in processing that protein into small components. It, end, it ends up as ammonia in the water, and the bacteria can take, of the re- take care of the rest of that. So I wanted to build a very simple no water change tank. I purposefully like underbuilt it. I built it worse on purpose so that anyone watching this video could like just build a tank that's similar to this. So I built this tank. Um, it's not the best tank that I could ever build, but I built like this to test um, how such a tank would function. So I made a tank. Nine months ago, I incrementally increased the amount of fish food going in, and then I will figure out the point at which point the tank cannot process it anymore and the nitrates start going up. So that's what I'm looking for here. So I build a tank, incrementally increase the amount of food going in, and then figure out at which point the nitrates start going up. That way, I can estimate how much food can go into this no water change tank without causing problems. Now, normally what I do is I feed my tanks really conservatively. Um, This just eliminates the risk of me overfeeding it and causing, introducing too much pollution that the tank can't handle. But with this experiment, I can have a baseline of how much food is too much and I can uh, feel safe with the knowledge that I can feed a certain amount and it's totally safe, right? So if you want to understand how the different components of this no water tank tank works, like the plants and deep substrate, I have a whole series on my channel explaining it. I'll put links in the description. Okay, so I set this tank up nine months ago during the winter of uh, 2020. And I have about two inches of substrate in the front area. And in the back, I have some plastic bottles with about five inches of substrate. So these two plastic bottles filled with substrate, this is the deep substrate component of my no water change system here. So it will provide some denitrification. Um, This tank has a 23 watt Amazon A300, A350 LED lamp. It's AMZ A350. Um, This is a local, I live in South Korea. This is just a local sort of cost effective brand. It's not like a high end brand. This costs about equivalent to about 25 US dollars. So it's not a really expensive LED. Um, I did not use a fancy like dedicated for plant growth type LEDs, which are much more expensive um, because again, I want anyone watching this to uh, just be able to build it. So the manufacturer does not provide lumen or PR, PAR values. That is typical of a cheaper LED light. I just want to show that you can use a more generic, just cheap LED and still have really good plant growth. Like you don't need a fancy uh, plant growth LED lamp that's way more expensive. Those things are good. They work, but they're not necessary. Like you can get away with a much cheaper lamp. So if you want to know exactly what kind of light will grow plants, I also have a whole series explaining that on my channel. I'll put links in the description. But anyways, the take home message here is that this is a relatively cheap, not built for plant LED light that I have here. Now, the important thing here is the food. So what I fed the tank is tetramin. It's from Tetra, flake food. It has about 40% protein content. As I've said before, the protein content is important because the protein is what ends up becoming ammonia eventually once the fish process it. 
Now I have duckweed, pearlweed, and some moss in the foreground. So I have a variety of plants going on here. And I have a small sponge filter. This creates some water flow. It adds some filtration and some aeration. So it's just a little safety net there um, for the tank. Now I start this tank with no fish, just plants and ram's horns. I always put the ram's horns in first because they are the most robust creatures I have. They just they they can handle really harsh water conditions really well. So um, I started off with them, and then I fed an average of 0.02 grams of tetramin uh, daily. I used the auto feeder. Um, now this auto feeder isn't like a precision precision equipment that can just exactly measure out how much food is going in, but it does a pretty consistent job of um, putting. Uh, food into the tank and how I figure out how much food exactly went in is I measure the weight of the food I fill the feeder at the beginning of the week and I measure the food that is left in the feeder at the end of the week and that way I can get a good average of how much food went in over the week um, of feeding so that's how I figured out how much food is going in and I increased it gradually over the months um, I did 50% water changes for the first four weeks so for the first month, I did water changes because you need to give the tank time to establish itself and the plants to establish the establish themselves so they can filter out the water and keep it in a water change. And after four weeks, I just topped up uh, evaporation with tap water. And after one month, I added several guppy fry. I added about 10 guppy fry. And uh, I gradually increased the feeding after that um, about 0 0.01 uh or 0.02 grams about every month. So I was incrementally increasing the amount of feed. Now ammonia rose to a peak about 3.0 milligrams per liter. That is the point where you're starting to get concerned, but it's not quite enough to kill your fish. And uh, I was getting a little worried thinking about doing a water change, but it didn't go up any further. So I just left it and I just kept it monitored and it didn't go up beyond that. And then uh, it dropped to undetect undetectable levels of ammonia at about month four, and it just stayed there for the rest of the experiment. So during the first one or two months of building a tank, it's very fairly typical to see some ammonia peak before your bacteria and tank is fully established. So um, I measured the TDS every week as well. It started off at, at about 120. That is what my tap water comes in at. And it gradually increased and stabilized about 260. I see this happen in most of my tanks. Um, it took about three months to reach that uh, equilibrium point. Some people watching my video say like your TDS, they think like the TDS will rise forever unless you add DO water and it'll just break your tank eventually. Um, that does not happen because your tank is not a sterile beaker. It is a living organism. The tank itself, you have to think of it as a living organism and eventually it'll reach equilibrium if you built it well enough. So yeah, TDS, if you do on a water change tank like this, it'll go up gradually and then it will find some point and it will reach equilibrium, equilibrium and it won't go up any further. Now the important bit, which is the nitrates. Um, the nitrates stayed unmeasurable for about eight months of the experiment. I just could not get a reading on them. It was always zero. And I detected about 12.5 milligrams per liter um, after uh, the eighth month, which is about two months ago. This is not a very high amount. It's pretty normal. If you have like just an average tank, 12.5 um, is a fairly normal reading. It's nothing to be concerned, but um, I could finally detect it. And uh, this was when I was feeding about 0 0.1 grams per day. It stayed 12.5 for two months without increasing or decreasing. So at this point, this is when I stopped the experiment because I believe the tank has reached equal equilibrium. And if I add any more food, I believe the nitrate levels will start to gradually increase over time. So this was the point where I reached the conclusion. I can add about 0 0.1 grams of feed per day, every day to the small, mediocre, no water change tank and it will stay safe as long as you do it slowly enough. Um, so that is my conclusion. With a six gallon tank, with some deep substrate built in, decent LED light, with some plants, and a variety of creatures inside, can handle about 0 0.1 grams of 40% uh, protein feed per day and survive for a really long time without water changes. That is the conclusion. I know most of you don't feed by measuring in like a scale, you just eyeball it. So I have measured out what 
about 0.1 gram is so you can get like a visual of what it looks like and that will also show you what it looks like when I put it into the tank. So it is a rather really large pinch and uh, I don't know about you but for me uh, that is uh, that is really overfeeding and you can just see that the huge amount of foods just go into the tank and the fish can't even handle it. Um, that is how much uh, food is going in every day and the nitrates are stable for two months. So if I feed like say one third of that, uh, which is about 0 0.03 grams a day, that would be still kind of feeding a lot for me in my standards, but that would be totally safe because that's like one third of the limit that I've tested here. So you can scale this up. I don't think it'll scale up directly, but you can get a rough idea of what a no water change tank incorporating deep substrate and plants can do here. So the conclusion is you built a nice tank like this and you don't have to do a super stellar job. You can just do a pretty mediocre tank like this. And uh, as long as you're not like super overfe overfeeding it like I'm doing right now, and it will probably stay no water change and stay safe for a really long time, at least several months. That is the conclusion of this experiment. So once again, I'm kind of surprised because this tank can definitely handle way more food than I'm used to feeding. Um, anyway, guys, anyways, guys, thanks for watching. I will be back with more experiments. I have experiments planned out. And uh, sadly, these experiments of mine, by their nature, I do no water exchange experiments and they take well, uh, several months. But that is the nature of my channel. Uh, stay patient and I will be back with more experiments. So stay, stay subscribed if you want to see uh, more of these no water exchange experiments of mine. Thank you for watching.